Well, we have three chapters we're going to be going over today, and um, I need to make sure I will get them posted. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking about, again, getting into the nuances. We're getting into the weeds of perio. And there is an excellent CE course coming up on Monday, February 22nd, uh, given by Bill Landers, who's one of my idols. And uh, I am a groupie of his, but he is all into the microbes. And you can't remove all the calculus um, ever, but we do the best we can. But how are you going to treat the disease? And that is getting in and controlling what we can control with our contributing factors as well as getting to the bugs that we're going to be delving into. So let's go into the local contributory factors for periodontal diseases. We have primary causes and the primary etiological factor is what? It is always, always, always biofilm. You don't call it dental plaque anymore but it's biofilm is the primary causative factor. It's not calculus, it's not anything else. So on your um, perio assessments, it's asking for primary and secondary factors. Primary is going to be what? Biofilm. Biofilm, yeah, always. Then you've got other things going on that don't initiate the disease, but it aggravates the disease. Um, the biofilm is there. So what is going to make the biofilm uh, react to the body more? What is in your mouth to make biofilm or plaque removal more difficult? those plaque retentive surfaces. So it's important to control or eliminate these contributory factors whenever possible. So the most significantly dentally related contributory, oh, it's still the title screen. Wait, stop share. Okay, hold on. I'm getting there, I think. Okay, I've got my title screen up. Do you see primary causative factors? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what did we say the primary causative factor is? Biofilm. Biofilm. Is it always biofilm? Yes. Can it be anything else? No. <laughs> no. It's always, there are so few alwayses, guys, so few. This is one of them. Then we've got our contributory factors that don't initiate the inflammation, but they contribute to, all right? So uh, they make the biofilm removal, plaque retentive surfaces more difficult. Can we control or eliminate any of those contributory factors? So... In the presence of um, biofilm, what is going to be aggravated by it? Most significant dentally related local contributory factors in the presence of biofilm are sites that are already affected by periodontitis. They have the greatest risk for future breakdown. So if you've had disease there before, the likelihood that you're going to get disease there again is pretty high. It's a susceptible area. It's strongly associated with an increased probability of developing periodontal disease. So if you've had an issue there before, it's going to be more likely to break down. Calculus is not a primary causative factor. 
but it's a local contributory factor because the calculus always has biofilm on top of it. It's hard, but it is a porous structure. So porous, it's got these tiny little holes in them and channels because it's rough. It's like a hard sponge, right, which collect bacteria. So this is going to be a fairly typical patient of what you might see in the uh, clinic. Would you say this is slight, moderate, heavy, or excessive calculus? Heavy. It would be heavy, yeah. And um, we don't know what difficulty this patient is because guess what? This might be the only area in the mouth that has the calculus. So you might going, oh, that's a difficulty four. And we might go, no, it's really a difficulty two because they don't have anything subgingively. And just getting the ultrasonic out, you're going to be able to buzz all this stuff off very easily. But look at the inflammation down here. Okay, is the inflammation caused by the biofilm or caused by the calculus or caused by both? It's caused by both. But calculus always has biofilm on top of it. Calculus, okay, is what some people will call tartar. Now, patients know the word tartar. And this is just one of my pet peeves is when we use tartar when we're talking to other professionals, okay? That is a lay term. The term is calculus. So what I've ended up doing is, you know, we try and elevate our patient's education. So we're talking about calculus, but we're saying you might know it as tartar. The commercials use it as tartar. So I, when I talk to patients, we'll have it kind of as a run on word, calculus or tartar. That's my run on word, All right? So tartar is one thing. The calculus is the Sorry, my phone is going crazy. Um, calculus is what we talk to each other about. Radiographic calculus. Only 45% of clinically visible calculus may be detected radiographically. This is usually a test question. You can see the calculus here. And you will have patients that you have this type of calculus everywhere, but it's not showing up on the x-rays. And you've worked, you've worked, you've worked the entire hour on your patient and you are spent. And the doctor comes in at the end and goes, oh, nice job, keep up the good work. And you just wanna smack them because nothing has shown up on the radiographs. But if you see this on the radiograph, you know that there's more calculus there than what you can see. So if I see this, I'm all, all automatically thinking difficulty four, because I know there's gonna be stuff down here, but the perio is not too bad. So you've got calculus attachments and it can attach to different things. It's a mechanical locking into the irregularities of cementum. So root surface calculus is much more difficult to remove than enamel surface calculus because enamel is smoother. Does that make sense? So the cementum can also resorb a little bit. You've got this... Um, uh, so you've got more roughness that the calculus can bond into. You have the acquired pellicle that the calculus can start forming on. And there's also some thought that the calculus can penetrate into the bacteria itself. We know the bacteria can morph and change from aerobic, anaerobic to aerobic and that type of thing. But uh, this bacteria is really, really smart stuff. So where is the calculus and how is it attached to the tooth or root surface? You might have somebody with 232, 232, or 212, 212 perio 
chartings, but if they have clinical attachment loss in root surfaces that are exposed and all of that root surface needs to be scaled because there's calculus on it, that's a very different type of cleaning than somebody who has 212, 212, and it's at the um, CEJ. Calculus will form on anything. It doesn't firmly attach to dental implants. It doesn't firmly attach to porcelain, but it will attach. They're finding on implants that's more superficial calculus. So it's easier to remove when it's on implants. But when you have implant threads, and if you don't know what implants are, there's a little metal screw here for the root form. But if you've got metal showing, that metal will develop biofilm and you can't scratch that metal with your instruments or it's going to uh, be an invitation for more bacteria. But it's the scratching of the metal that we have to be careful of. If it's just the uh, smooth neck abutment, we don't need to worry about it. But if there are threads, like the screw threads showing, you're never going to be able to get those clean. So Alexis is, so what's the difference between heavy and excessive calculus buildup? Uh, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, heavy is heavy, excessive is, oh my God, I don't even know where to start. Can you use the ultrasonic on the um, screws of implants or no? No. Okay. So you just cannot clean those at all except with like a toothbrush. Well, no, you can, um, they have implant inserts. They have little plastic uh, silicone um, tips that can go over a regular ultrasonic tip. Okay. So it doesn't scratch. They have titanium instruments. They've got, you have plastic instruments. A plastic instrument and um, and a ProfiJet would get all of this stuff off okay. fairly easily. But again, if the threads were showing, you can't disinfect those well. What's the type of calculus? Super gingival calculus. All right, uh, or subgingival calculus. Supergingival calculus is usually associated with the sites adjacent to the salivary ducts. Okay, so think about where they are. The Stenson's duct is where? Okay, between the maxillary first, around the maxillary first molars, Stenson's duct. And then you've got your sublingual caruncle mandibular anterior linguals. So that is where most of the supergingival cal calculus is going to be, especially with the mandibular anterior, because you're on a curve, it's on the lingual surfaces, it's more difficult for the patient to get access to. So that look at that mineralization of the calculus. It's 30% mineralized for supergingival. But that subgingival calculus, remember the bacteria starts supergingively and then it starts cascading down subgingively. So the minerals are derived from uh, the gingival curricular fluid as well as the inflammatory exudates, right? It's 60% mineralized. So which is harder, the denser, the supra or the sub? So. so the sub, 60% mineralized, hard, hard, hard. So it may be gray or black um, due to, okay, the color changes because of the bacteria involved as well as the hemoglobin, the blood pigments coming from the sulcular lining and the gingival crevicular fluid. So if it's gray or black, it's been in there a long time. been in there a long time. Subgingival calculus. This is a crown, porcelain crown here, CEJ. Things look pretty clean, but look at all that calculus. Weren't able to reach it. 60% calcified. What is calculus? It's formed from crystals of hydroxyapatite. Where else, what else has hydroxyapatite in it? 
your enamel. Brushite and Whitlockite, okay? Hydroxyapatite's the big one. What are the minerals involved? Calcium, phosphorus, enamel, magnesium, zinc. Yes, it even has fluoride. Know the composition of calculus. Contributory factors, anatomical factors. Is there crowding of the mandibular anterior teeth so the toothbrush can't adequately get things? What is the position of the teeth in the arch? Now with this also, you're gonna be doing on your occlusal assessment, your rotations. And that's where you draw your imaginary line to tell whether something is in the arch circle or not. So, I mean, is it rotated? Is it verted? Is it, now look at this here. Okay, this would be a mesiofacial version. Mesiofacial version, torso version. This might be a facial. It might be out of the line of occlusion. We don't know. Slight, well, it's trace, slight, moderate, excessive. How much calculus do you think this is? Moderate? Yeah, moderate. And um, there's some recession, I'm seeing some, uh, and so again, you can't just tell by the mandibular anterior what that difficulty level is going to be on that patient. Root morphology, we're looking at contributory factors here. Remember that gingival palatal groove or that lingual palatal groove that goes all the way up? So if you see a nice big groove here, you have to make sure that you're scaling adequately here, but you need to also make sure when you're probing that you're walking that probe so that you're feeling this area because you could just skip it and keep on going and miss this whole pocket if a pocket's developing there. Very difficult to reach. Cervical enamel projections. The highest incidence, this is that learning thing here, the highest incidence is on the buckle of the mandibular second molars. Remember, so you've got your, your CEJ and then you've got your enamel going into the furca like that. So this area here is a pocket area that's underneath the gum tissue. Enamel pearls. A misplaced clump of enamel, usually in the furcation or bifurcation of a molar. And you can see it radiographically. Just like an enamel projection, you don't have periodontal ligaments around it, so that is a pocket area. So what the dentist would do if they, they know about this, they'd go in and they, they'd flap the tissue and they just plasty this here to make it more cleanable. Furcation involvements, very difficult to clean. If you have a patient with any type of furcation, their prognosis is poor. Prognosis, what's the likelihood of future breakdown with a um, vacation is very high, so their prognosis is poor. Vacations, one, two, three, and four. If my gingival margin was here and my neighbor's probe could go all the way through, what would my vacation be? A one, two, three, or four? 
for? A three? It would be a three. If it's covered with gingiva, it's three. A through and through furcation covered with gingiva is three. But this area here is a four because you can clean it. So sometimes dentists will make a three into a four. They'll remove that gum tissue, reshape the bone a little bit here so this can be exposed so they can get a little proxa brush in there and they can apply fluoride in there. Much easier for the patient to maintain than if it was covered up with gum tissue. Does that Ms. make D, sense? Wouldn't that be sensitive to the patient? Like if all that's exposed like that to the point where you can like put a proxy brush into pro like underneath, like it would, I would think that that'd be painful. Everybody reacts differently, but then you've got your desensitizing agents that you're putting on. You could put Gluma, which is um, cavity liner. You could put varnish. You could do chlorhexidine. You could, there's lots of things that you can do. Arginine is now one of the big, um, one of the big things that patients are using and that are in desensitizing products as well. Because it's a newly exposed area, you have to harden that area up with repeated fluoride. And then doesn't that mean that the tooth would be like mobile? Could be. Okay. Yeah, these are heroic actions. Heroic actions. Now, you know, what the dentist might recommend is, is what kind of treatment? You got a pocket there. Let's remove this tooth. We'll put some bone in. You know, you'll, you'll put bone in here. You'll wait six months and then you can put an implant. But does the patient want that? So you give the patient the option. Iatrogenic factors. What did we in dentistry create as a contributory factor to calculus? Restorative dentistry is, I mean, plaque retentive surfaces, if the margins aren't flush, because they're overhanging or too shallow. Big thing. Exodontics. Okay, what have we done? Orthodontics, iatrogenic factors. Think about all that surface area with ortho. Iatrogenic factors that hygienists can do. We whittle away these root surfaces. We whittle, whittle, whittle trying to get every speck of calculus and stain off those mandibular anterior root surfaces. And all we're doing is removing cementum every three months when the patient's coming in, thinking we're doing them benefits. My mother had uh, perio surgery. And so this was, let's see, this would be a mandibular anterior here. And over the years, I was seeing her every three months. I was creating and then her gum line was here. I was whittling away her roots. So the periodontist had to call me and he said, Betsy, stop. <laughs> I, like, I, you know, I was a novice dental hygienist, but I, but I thought I was doing her good by getting rid of all of that stuff. Kind of looks like a wine glass. plaque retentive surfaces. We used to, uh, when I was a student, we'd have to go in and we'd remove this overhang. There was a skill evaluation we had to do with, uh, we'd get a gold knife and an ultrasonic and we'd try and remove this overhang. We don't do that anymore. If we see this, we bring it up to the dock and say, something's gotta be done. Exodontics, extractions may adversely affect adjacent teeth. Think about how fast those teeth want to shift. You've got mesial drift, you've got supra eruption. I love the Three Stooges. 
Curly was my favorite. I'm going to tell you just a little story. My, uh, my uh, grandfather didn't speak any English, and we'd have to, when we'd go visit him in the Bronx, you know, um, in little Italy. Uh, anyway, on Sundays, he'd always watch the Three Stooges, and, and we'd be sitting with them, and he'd kind of tap my shoulder, and he'd talk to me in Italian, you know, and he, as he's laughing at this type of stuff. So every time I see Three Stooges, I think of my grandfather. Orthodontics, ay, ay, ay. Just the act of moving the teeth is going to create some gingival inflammation. Then you've got your brackets and your bands and your wires and your elastics all creating surface area. Very difficult for patients to maintain. So you can imagine being a preteen and trying to instruct this preteen on the necessity of doing three different brushing techniques. You've got to do the charters. You've got to do the bash. You've got to do this. You've got to do the water pick. You've got to do, you know, floss threaders. Yeah, they're not, oh my goodness. Traumatic factors. Toothbrush trauma. Remember we talked about medium hard bristle brushes? Still a lot of patients out there that want to do it, want to use it. The harder, the better. Factitious disease. Who remembers what factitious disease is? Something that like you can determine how it happened? Yes, and the patient's doing it to themselves. Factitious disease, they're biting their nails. They are uh, chewing on something, causing attrition. They are putting their fingernail in an area and scrape, scrape, scraping, creating some sort of um, erosion or abrasion along the gum line area. Factitious disease, they're doing it to themselves. Food impaction, that's going to um, create issues with the bone and bioretention, chemical injury. Patients will put aspirin directly on their gum tissue. Patients will use uh, mouthwash because it burns and they like to feel the burn. Patients will use things that they're allergic to, not realizing that they're allergic to it. One of the big ingredients that patients seem to be allergic to inside the mouth is cinnamon. And that is a very popular a flavoring agent with dental products. Occlusion, biofilm in the, we have a whole chapter on occlusion, but biofilm in and occlusal discrepancies, the two together can wreak havoc. Oral piercings, you've got a hole that is more plaque retentive because you now have a hole where a hole was not meant to be. You're wearing an adornment on it. Again, plaque retentive surface. And if it's inside the mouth, especially on the tongue and it doesn't fit well, you are slapping it against tooth structure or gum tissue, which will eventually create recession. So tongue piercings are notorious for having recession on the mandibular anterior linguals. A lot of that is due to the tongue rod not being uh, fitted properly. Toothbrush trauma. If you continually irritate the gums, those gum tissues are going to go away. Factitious disease. What's the patient doing? Food impaction. Look at the bone here. You just see it dissolving. Chemical burns. Dental bleaching material, okay? The peroxide can uh, chemically burn the gums. Strong mouthwashes. Topical drugs like cocaine, absolutely.
has anybody seen a patient in their practice that has had um, cocaine issues and they have a hole in the roof of their mouth? It can create from the snorting from the nose, it can create actually a hole in the palate. Occlusion, another reason why we need good vertical bite wings. This is what the hygienist is looking at. We don't, you know, we don't, we're looking at the, um, for cavities or caries in between the teeth, but this is the, if we took a horizontal bite wing, that's what we'd get versus a ver vertical bite wing, we would be able to get all the way down to here. So we can see that there's a widening PDL here, which is occlusal trauma. it may increase the rate of periodontitis if plaque-induced inflammation is also present. Occlusal trauma alone does not cause bone loss. You have to have the biofilm in with it. Piercings. Local contributory factors. Okay, local is in the mouth, okay, versus systemic. Okay, so it's local. It contributes to the disease but doesn't cause it. And then factors are circumstances, facts, or influences that contribute to a result or outcome. So let's take a couple questions. Radiographs are an excellent tool for determining the amount of subgingival calculus. True or false? Most subgingival calculus will be apparent on the radiograph. Is it true, false? C? Both, both false. It's me. Uh, both are false, because remember, only about 45% of the calculus shows up. So most of the calculus isn't going to show up on the radiograph. But what we do when there are big chunks in there, we will uh, sometimes take a post-scaling bite wing just to see if we've gotten a hard to reach area. It's not a definitive case that we've gotten that big chunk off, but if we're seeing it on the radiograph, we'll take a post scaling uh, bite wing, more for our satisfaction than the patient's. But anyway, false, false. Radiographs are not an excellent tool because most subgingival calculus will not show up on the radiograph. Supergingival calculus will be most prevalent in which of the following areas? C. 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 Yes. Okay, think about where those um, salivary ducts are. Occlusal trauma may cause which of the following? D. D. Okay, so it should be bone loss really with biofilm because you have to have biofilm in there. Tooth mobility and widening of the PDL is pure occlusal trauma. Bone loss is in association with the um, biofilm. The palatal gingival grooves are on what teeth? Is it? D? D, it's the lateral incisors, maxillary lateral incisors, yes. D. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> let's take uh, let's take a five minute break. What time is it now? Ms. D, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. I'm sorry. So just to go back really quick, how can you tell the difference between if a tooth has an enamel pearl and like if it's calculus, like a piece of big 
Well, the enamel pearl is going to look very smooth, unlike calculus. And having a chunk of calculus in a furcation is, like that is, is more rare. And guess what? You're not going to be able to remove it. You're going to be working 10 minutes. And it's not coming off. OK. Thank you. OK, let's take a five minute break. And I'll see if I can pull up the next thing. <laughs> 